Boundary Church, let us all stand. It's such a great day to worship the Lord. Let's put our hands together. We know that God is up to something good. When I'm in the roughest water, I won't go under, I won't drown. And when I'm in over my head, I know that you won't let me down. And when I'm broken and down to nothing, I know that you are always up to something good. to be together in the house of the Lord and those that are joining us online, a welcome to you. Um, if you were with us on Wednesday for one of our Ash Wednesday services, what an incredible time of, of just worship and prayer and message that was in the word um, as we kick off this season of Lent. Um, if you were able to join us, at what a great time it was. We have other incredible worship ex uh, experiences um, coming up in Lent.
content and opportunities for study so that we can really make use of this time that God has given us, this season in the church where we can kind of turn inward and really consider um, God's goodness in light of just all of our humanity and, and the miracle there. So there are Lent guides. If you didn't pick one up last week, um, I think we have a few out at our connection point that kind of details some of the stuff we have going on in this season. And of course, you can hop online anytime um, to find out more information. If you are visiting with us, it is so good to have you with us today. We have these connect cards in the seat pockets in front of you, and that is a great place for you to fill out your information. You can turn it into any member of our host team or any of the black boxes at the back of the room, and that lets us um, reach out to you in the week ahead and say thanks for worshiping with us and see if you have any questions. There's also a place on the back for prayer requests. Um, you know, praying with and for each other is just one of the best things that we can do as a church family, and I say it every week because it's super true. And so if you do have something that we can lift up, our prayer team can lift up for you, you can turn that in to any of the host team members or the black box as well. There is a lot to lift up today, a lot of exciting things coming up in this season and in the seasons ahead. So let's take a look at the news and check it out. Our sermon series on being a witness has sparked so much interest in the life of our community to share the gospel both locally and abroad. If you are feeling the Lord leading you to be a part of a disciple-making movement, then this trip could be for you. Foundry Church will be partnering with a mission organization to go to India this summer to share the gospel to some of the most unreached people in the world. Please join us for an informational meeting on Sunday, February 25th from 3 to 4.30 at the Jones Road campus in our cafeteria. We can't wait to see what God has in store for you. Good morning, Foundry family. I am so excited to share with you that we will be bringing back our six-week short-term small group experience this coming Lenten season. Lent groups offer an excellent way for you to deepen your faith and build connections with others here at Foundry. Whether you're new to the church and looking to get plugged in for the first time, or you've been here for a long time, we invite you to consider joining a Lent group to meet others, grow together, and begin hearing from God in a new community of faith. Groups start up the week of February 18th and will gather once a week for an hour or so to discuss the Lent sermon series, Facets of God. For more information about days and times available and to register, log on to foundrychurch.org slash Lent group. We hope you'll consider joining us. During the month of February, we are kicking off our I Heart VBS campaign. Anyone who wants to volunteer can now start signing up to serve for the largest summer outreach to the community. Volunteering at Vacation Bible School is life-changing to a child who has never said yes to Jesus. Will you consider saying yes to Vacation Bible School? You can go to foundrychurch.org slash events to register today. Revelation with all of its visions, its symbols, its allegories regarding future events. It's a book that's puzzled so many people. I hope you'll join us February 20th as we seek to unlock some of the mystery and meaning found in Revelation. from kids to adults and everything in between, um, how good it is to have so many different opportunities. And I hope you'll be in prayer about what God may be asking you to be a part of here in the life of the church and as we grow as disciples. Um, would you turn with me to these words from Psalm 8 as we continue on in the spirit of worship? Lord, O oh Lord, how majestic is your name in all of the earth. For you have set your glory in the heavens. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and stars which you have set into place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? 
Pray with me. Oh, Heavenly Father, God, we, we think about your creation and, and I, we think about your majesty. And, and, and that just, just the words that you spoke brought all of that into being. I think about what it is to stare up at the night sky and, and, or to be, to be in the mountains and to just be in awe of what you accomplish. And yet, you are here with us. And our imperfection and our lowliness and our brokenness, you are here with us. You have sent your son to the point of the cross. You have sent your spirit to fill this place. Lord, do that this morning. Take us in whatever condition we walked in the back door in. Take whatever, whatever anxiety or worry or distraction is living inside of us, God. Move it out of the way so that we may see you in all of your majesty today as we worship, as we pray, as we meditate on your word. God, let this hour be your hour, for you alone are worthy. And in Jesus' mighty name, we worship in your name. Amen. Friends, let us join together in the house of the Lord and come into this place to worship the God who is over all things. Amen. Y'all stand up. Amen.
we believe Yes, we can see it One day just in what you do Angels Bodies are still being raised Giants are still being slain God, we believe it Yes, we can see it Wonders are still what you do. We are here for you. Come and do what you do. Set our hearts on you. Come and do what you do. We set our hearts on you. Everybody, we're excited to kick off the season of Lent. This is a journey to Easter, and it's an invitation for us to maybe go a little deeper in our faith, engage in some ways that that invite us to know Christ in a deeper way, know His Word in a deeper way. Um, so, I want to encourage you again to be at the join us for the Bible Lab this this Tuesday as we look at the Book of Revelation. I want to invite you, especially, to jump into a Lent group. 
maybe that's a, a big step for you, I, I would just encourage you to do it. You won't regret. Jumping into a group will change the way you understand and know God and walk with him, and that's our hope for you. So I encourage you to do that. And whatever the Lord leads you to, I just hope you'll take a step of faith and you'll, um, you'll seek to know God better in this season and invite his spirit to work in your heart. Um, it's an invitation to do that as we look at the different facets of God and how he works in our life. Um, when you give, you're, you're doing that as well. That's one of the ways we can step into our faith in a deeper way. Uh, it's also one of the ways you can provide, help be a part of providing these types of opportunities for others to know, follow, and share Jesus. So thank you for the ways that you give. You'll see on the screen listed different ways you can give no matter where you are. If you're in person worshiping with us today, there are boxes also at the exits where you can give. Uh, but let's join together and pursue Christ in a deeper way in this season. Hallelujah. You can stand if you like and worship with us. Oh Lord, we worship you. Marvelous how your works, we worship you. So will I 
thank you, Lord, thank you, Lord, yes. On a hill you created the light of the world, abandoned in darkness to die. Mm -hmm. And as you speak, a hundred billion failures disappear. are your works, Father. Our soul knows it well, God. We are so glad to be here, Father, this morning, gathered in your presence, Father, gathered to worship you as your people, Father. God, right now, we just focus our, our eyes, our attention on you, Lord God, because you deserve all of the glory and all of the praise, God. Father, there's something you want to say to us this morning. There's something that you want to get to us, Father, from your heart, God. So we just open ourselves up, God, and we say, Holy Spirit, have your way. Come in. Do what only you can do. Thank you, Father. We are in a move right now of your presence, of your spirit, of your favor, of your peace that is raining down on us right now, Father. So we receive your word. Thank you for the word that is going to come forth. Thank you that it blesses our lives. And I pray, Father, that we will walk away today, Father, seeing you differently, Father, and knowing more of your love for us, God. We give you praise and honor and glory in the name of Jesus. And everybody said, amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated. May we know the nature of God as he has revealed himself through scripture. Creator, revealer, king, judge, priest, father, shepherd, redeemer. high school, there was a, my principal's name was uh, Mrs. Bowman, and we were a small school. I graduated from a class of 20 people, so I tell folks I was top 10 on my class. <laughs> Easy top 10 on my class. <clears throat> top 20 is still pretty good. <clears throat> but I remember the reputation was that she was a mean lady, and that you didn't want to get on her bad side, and you kind of wanted to stay away from her. So as an eighth grader, ninth grader, 10th grader, I did, I just stayed away from Mrs. Bowman. We'd make fun of her hair, that's what you do as kids, you make fun of your, you know, elders, and you think it's great, and just stayed away from Mrs. Bowman until 11th grade, <clears throat> I was in class, and I got in trouble in class, and I was told to go to the principal's office. So I could have walked out of the class, taken a left, and been there in probably 45 seconds. But instead, I went to the right, and I took my time. It took me about 20-some minutes to get to her place, say hi to all these other teachers, played some soccer, made my way back <laughs> to her office. <clears throat> and, and when I got there, I, I remember she just looked at me, and she's like, hello, Luis. I was like, 
she knows my name. Like, I've never really talked to this lady ever until that moment. And she was very kind. She was courteous. And she was not condescending. She wasn't mad. And she told me, why are you here? And I told her why. And, and she treated me with such grace. And I had a total new view on what this woman was like. The following year, she ended up being uh, one of my teachers, senior year. And we would have coffee when I get there in the mornings, and we'd talk. I got to know other areas of her life. Uh, I thought she just lived at the school and always came out of the closet just to teach every morning. I didn't know where she, she grew up and her family and why she was in Costa Rica teaching after so many years, an elderly woman. And really, we kind of became friends after a while. <clears throat> and I think there's times in life where we operate based on certain presuppositions of a person. And this is the same thing that happens with us and God. If we have a certain perception of God, it will impact the way we relate to God or not relate to God. And here's the thing, I think sometimes we take what other people say about God and we take it for what it is or we take somebody else's <clears throat> opinion or our own opinion and then we create our own framework in reality through which we begin to relate to God or create our own reasons why we don't relate to God. But I'm convinced of this. If God is something that can be determined or created in our own minds, then there's a pretty good chance that's not God. Some will say that God is just a figment of our imagination. Others will say it's a social construct. Others will say and throw God in the same thing as religion, that it's just a crutch for the needy, you know, a way for us human beings to cope with our weaknesses and we could spend hours, days, and years unpacking and trying to debunk and refute some of these statements or statements of this nature. But the reality is that as Christians, our worldview derives from Scripture. And we believe in a God that predates the created order as you and I see it today. We believe in a God that is outside of time and space as you and I know it. And our beliefs are determined by what Scripture says and the Bible is the best way for us to know the nature and the character of God. Not YouTube, not what your grandma says, no one else but scripture itself. If you really want to know God, you must get into God's word and allow God's word to get into you. If not, you're gonna be formulating all sorts of opinions of what everybody else thinks God is, but you'll never really know. And the beautiful thing is you can know for yourself. All of us can know for ourselves. Don't even just take my word for it. Go read scripture for yourself, read it with others, and you'll see things start to come alive. I'm convinced as I read scripture that God is a God who wants to be known. He is not far away and hiding from us, kind of the stupid hide and seek game because we've been so bad and then he shows up when we say we're sorry or he's just a guy that just created and then left us to be and then one day poof, it'll all be done and it's all for nothing. When you read scripture, you read about a God, a God who is revealing himself over and over to all of humanity. Inevitably, I think whether you believe in God or not, you start to ask these questions and they come out in certain ways. What is God like? And how do I know him? How can I know him? These are questions that inevitably, I think, pop up in us. So during this Lenten season, these six weeks leading up to Easter Sunday, I wanna encourage you to press into this series because we're gonna be looking at different facets of God, different roles of God. It has vast implications for us and how we're present in this life. For example, today we're gonna look at God as creator. Well, if God is creator, that means that we are his creation. One of the roles we'll look at in the weeks to come is if God is father, there's implications for that for you and for me. That means that we are his children and we'll play that out and what it looks like in our lives. But God isn't just a force zooming around in this world or an energy as some people like to describe it. a personal God. He's a knowable God. And he has designed us, created us to be in communion with him, to know him, to be in relationship with him. And throughout history, we see God communicating with us through word and deed. 
And God chooses to speak to us in various ways, and he uses visible symbols to reveal invisible truths to us about his power, about his purpose, about his person. The God of the Bible is a triune God, meaning is three in one, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. From the very beginning, in Genesis chapter one, we read, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That God is Father, Son, Holy Spirit, the triune God creating heavens and earth. And now the earth was formless and empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. Later on in that same chapter, we read, and then God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. This isn't the fact that God has multiple personalities or split personality, and all of a sudden he's talking with different pronouns. He wasn't trying to be cool or anything. What he's tr talking right now is giving us a glimpse into the nature of who he is and how he operates he says, I am three in one. I am a social being, if you will, interacting within himself, and he begins to create, not just all of creation as we know it, but also creates us as his children. <clears throat> so from the very beginning, God reveals to his creation who he is. And throughout the entire narrative of scripture, from Genesis to Revelation, we come across many metaphors and images that give us a glimpse into who God really is. And it's impossible to think that one single metaphor or image will fully encompass and explain accurately who God is. God is infinite. He's eternal, he is vast, he is immeasurable by any of our means. He is all these things that I think it's incredibly difficult for our minds to really wrap our minds around this idea of who God is. And yet God in his grace gives us tidbits of what he's like. And he begins to reveal himself <clears throat> to us throughout scripture. Dr. Alan Coppage, who happened to be a professor of mine, good friend of the family, did studies over 15 years. And his belief is that there are eight major roles throughout scripture that reveal God to us. There are many other sub-roles underneath those roles, and we'll get into some of those in the weeks to come, <clears throat> even some today. But this idea that you could go through Scripture and see which role God is speaking, revealing himself as. The roles are, first one we're gonna look at is creator. Second one is gonna be king, revealer, priest, judge, a father, a redeemer, and a shepherd. And he says that these are the dominant roles that we'll see all throughout scripture. He would take his Bible, he had a color for each one. And you'll start seeing them woven together in the way that the, the different authors of scripture would express themselves about God. And the metaphors begin to be mixed together a little bit. It's really rich and I think it would serve us well to get into scripture and go through it slowly. We have opportunities coming up. If you haven't joined a Lent group and you've never done this, we're gonna pray together, read scripture together, ask some questions. It might be a great first start for you. Find a group in a time that works for you. Sign up only six weeks. And we're gonna look at some of these facets of God in these six weeks, but I think it could be a great fresh start for you to begin to see a different dimension of God. Each facet of God conveys something about who he is and our relationship to him. For instance, if you were to only talk about me as pastor, some of you only know me as a pastor, that's only a small part of who I am. I played in many different roles, whether you talk to my kids or you talk to my spouse or you talk to colleagues, everything else. I'm not a pastor to everyone. People, I'm friends, I'm a son. Same thing with you. Think about what single role would you want people to use to describe you? Like one single one, only one? We, play, we have so many different hats that describe who we are, or beanies, or he's wearing a beanie. And they're like, what? <clears throat> that, that we wear that truly describe who we are. So as we journey into this season of Lent, I wanna encourage you to press in to each facet each week of who God is. Because it will give us a solid theology, a, a more rounded, robust theology and framework of who we are in light of who God is. If not, I think we run the danger of being incredibly frustrated 
with God. For instance, those who only view God as Father will grow incredibly frustrated when they come and see injustice in this world. Because a father wouldn't allow injustice. Well, this is where the role of king comes into play. And we need to press into that role. And we'll look at it in a few weeks, but I wanna encourage you to press in as difficult as it may be. And there are two overarching themes that Coppage says that begin to tether these things together. And it's this idea of God's transcendence, that means he is apart from his creation and his holiness, and they go hand in hand. Some will debate and say, well, it's really the sovereignty of God, the power of God. Some will say it's really about his love. Others will say, no, it's his ability to give life and sustain life. This is what it's really about. But I think the case can be made as you read all of scripture that it's really about his holiness. His holiness drives those other characteristics, if you will, of God. It's God's holiness. The idea of holiness is central to who God is and it seems to drive every other characteristic and facet of God. No other category that describes God is so pervasive in holding these metaphors together as is the holiness of God. This is the unifying attribute of God throughout everything. So you're asking, okay, what is holiness? As you go into the root word in the Hebrew, it speaks to this idea of separation. And it's widely believed throughout, and it's the accepted viewpoint, that it it also denotes this idea of being cut off or withdrawn or set apart, if you will. Isaiah 43, 15, we read, I am the Lord, your holy one, Israel's creator, your king. All of a sudden, we see three different roles in one sentence used interchangeably, but you see the holy one leading with holiness, the creator, your king. We see the link between God's holiness and his role as creator right off the bat. I mean, I think it's so easy for us to simply say, yeah, yeah, I get it, he's holy. You know, oh, yeah, he's holy. But I don't think we understand the implications of holy for our own lives. Because his holiness has huge implications upon our own life. Because we were made in his image. And when we talk about God being holy, we're not just saying that he's apart from the created order. God is different than anything in this created world and different than us, than humanity. God's holiness sets him apart from everyone and everything. He is above everything that you and I could ever see, touch, smell, imagine. Creation and everything in it is not an extension of God, but rather one, he is 100% separate from it. There's this pantheistic way, worldview that says God is in everything. God is the tree. God, you are God. We are you. And I get it. It's a distortion of what scripture is saying. A major dis- distortion. The book of John talks that we will be one with the Father, but we're not God. It's very clear in scripture that Christ, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, are apart from the created order. God declared through the prophet Isaiah, this is what the Lord says, the Holy One of Israel and its maker concerning things to come. Do you question me about my children or give me orders about the work of my hands? It is I who made the earth and created mankind on it. My own hand stretched out the heavens and I marshal the starry hosts. He's saying, I got this, I made this. My fingerprints are all over it, but I'm not that. And at one point, when Job's complaining to God, and he's interacting with God, and I don't know if you've ever done this, if you've ever complained to God, which is okay, by the way. There's a, there's a way, there's an actual name for you complaining to God. It's called a lament. You got an issue, take it to God. You're ticked off about something, take it to God. He can take it. He's not gonna smack you around. He's gonna, he's gonna listen. He's gonna interact with you. But be prepared, because God speaks back. And he says to Job, where were you when I laid the earth's foundation? Where were you when I hung the stars? Have you ever given orders to the moon? Have you ever told the sun to rise and the sun to set? Because Job, you're thinking you're the center of all of this, but let me tell you, I am the creator. You are my creation and everything within it. And we have the tendency, I think, sometimes to think that we're the center of the universe. And that somehow everything was created for us. 
So when things don't go our way, we go and whine to God, and God says, I get it. I get it, but let me bring you back to reality for a second. I spoke, and it happened. And in your situation, I want to speak, and maybe something will happen. God wasn't pulling any punches with Job, and I don't think he's pulling any punches with us. God stands apart from creation, and creation obeys him. He doesn't obey his creation. It is by faith that we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what is visible. That's Hebrews 11. There's an element of faith in believing that God's made everything and in many ways continues to make things. As followers of Christ, we believe in a God who is the creator. <clears throat> the creation of people, however, not only describes the physical life, but also the spiritual life that sets us apart from all other forms of created beings here on earth. When God formed Adam from the dust of the earth, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being, scripture says. It was the breath of the spirit of God that breathed into humankind that made him unique to all the other creatures of the universe. This was a foreshadowing of the kind of life that God was also going to create within us. There's the physical life, then there's the spiritual life. And I think in many ways, it still happens today. So God is still creating spiritual life, but he's also creating actual life. When the psalmist cries out in 139, he says, for you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I praise you because I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. And I know that full well. God is still in the business of creating life. When I've talked to people who have been broken, who have been hurt, who have been abandoned, who have wounds of the soul they can't seem to overcome, when they come to the grips that God had a plan for them in the very formation of their being, that God formed them in their mother's womb, that they are not here by accident, that God has a purpose and a design for their lives, when that begins to come into alignment, into focus, I've noticed many people begin to experience healing deep down in their souls. Because it's beyond us and what we know that there is a God who created me. And if God created, that means there's creative intent for us. Every facet of God ultimately culminates in the person of Jesus Christ. And we see this in the New Testament. And the language used around creation is language related to agriculture or language related to anything that you're making. And they're intertwined. Paul uses a rooted, built up, and established it's these metaphors, again, of God creating something, growing something, but they're intertwined. For instance, Jesus is depicted as a cultivator. And you have the different parables related to the, to the vineyard, or growing something inside of us, the, in the soil of our hearts, that's what God does. Then building a firm foundation, that's this whole idea of God creating. In the Old Testament, <clears throat> carries on a little bit in the New, this whole idea that we're clay in the potter's hands. Again, he's making something. And then something we see personified in Jesus is this role of physician, of healer. You see Jesus performing so many healings throughout his ministry. These analogies provide different perspectives of God's role as creator. And they highlight for us not only God's creative power, but also his desire to care for his creation. And we see a God that, that not only creates, but stays close to his creation. And later we see how he enters creation. We know that Jesus was present at creation, but we also know that he continues to impart life in many different ways, physically and spiritually. <clears throat> when God breathed humanity into being, that gave us, pressed within us, the image of God. Stop and think about for a second. That there is something divine in you, in me,
because God breathed. The image of our creator God is reflected in us in so many ways. I'm gonna go through five of them quickly. Number one, freedom of will to make choices. Yes, we're limited in some of our capacity to choose, but you have freedom. We could debate that too, but you have some kind of freedom. You're free to debate. Number two, the ability to take responsibility over the created order, often referred to as the political image, but given men and women dominion over creation. Number three, creativity, expressed in people's ability to work and to, to raise their children, as well as the aesthetics expressed in beauty and music and art, you name it. You're, we are creative beings. Number four, we have a conscience, the ability to distinguish between right and wrong. And I love this idea when people don't believe in God or say there is no God, but somehow will in the same breath say, but that is wrong. Where did this idea of right and wrong come from if there is no God? There's something within us that says that is right and that is wrong. We have the ability to choose that. And number five, our spirituality and immortality, that we are spiritual beings just like God also created to be immortal. Second Corinthians says, chapter five, verse 17, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone. So you start seeing like, okay, God is in his restoration process, what's really happening? See, overall, we were created to bear the image of God and to be holy as God is holy because he breathed into us. That's, we begin to see this correlation between the nature of God and what's happening in us now, the introduction of sin into this world messed everything up for everybody. It's still messing things up for us. Whenever you rub up to something in your heart, in your mind, that you're saying, man, that's messed up. You see an injustice. You said, somebody has to do something about that. This needs to change. You're rubbing up against some kind of sin or the effects of sin. See, when God created something, he created it to be a certain way. It's this idea of shalom, of the way things ought to be. When that order is broken, there's something within us that cries out that should not be that way. And we cry out to God and we want to see it change. And that's why we know at the end of time that there'll be the restoration of this world. No more tears, no more injustice, no more pain, no more suffering. That's why we cry out against these things of atrocities and wars and suffering and betrayal, all that, because that is the manifestation of sin. That's why we can't reduce this idea of sin to just one mere action or a word or a list, because sin leads to a state of sinfulness. And under that comes all the different actions. Our nature, our image has been tarnished, has been marred. And this is why we list certain things where as created beings, we end up worshiping things that have been created versus worshiping our creator. It's what the Bible calls idolatry. Sin results in general depravity of mankind, affecting us physically and mentally and morally. And in that comes all types of diseases and infirmities, mentally, physically, you name it. Unable to reflect the moral character of God his holiness in our lives. Sin blocks that from us. Sin affects the natural image of God in us, impairing our ability to be creative, to be in community, to be in right relationship with one another. And yet in the midst of all that, in God's grace, we still retain a significant portion of God's natural image within us. And yet he's working to restore our will, our desires, our feelings, our everything as we respond to God's salvation for us. And this is where God's salvation plan kicks in. Our creator cares about his creation. He didn't just create it and step away and said, good luck. He entered into us, into the created order. Through Christ Jesus, he became one of us and begins to save us from sin. And this idea, speaking to a slightly different role of God here, the redeeming role, but the holiness of God kept him away from sin. But the love of God pushes him to pursue us. So you got this holy love of God becoming human, becoming obedient to the point of death on a cross for us. 
And he says, now I am calling you to be holy as I am holy. He is calling us into a journey of separation, separation from the world, from sin, from unholiness, into a deeper union with him, making us more and more into his image. This is the journey of holiness. Some will scoff at it, some will mock it, but I'm gonna tell you, this is the journey that we were created for, to reflect the holiness of God in our lives. This is where the Holy Spirit does a deep and lasting work in us. This is where we shed things that have held us captive and things that we were addicted to for so long and the strongholds are demolished and where erroneous forms of thinking we begin to shed. This is where our priorities begin to shift. Our values are altered. Everything beginning to reflect more and more the character and nature of God in our lives. This happens at a personal level, but also at a collective level. Because when <clears throat> God created us, he created us out of this community, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So this social being, if you will, created us to be social as well. So when he saves us from our sin, from the effects of sin, and he cancels that, he says, I don't just save you now until whatever happens, whatever, we go to heaven. But even starting now, I save you into a family. You go from death to life. I want you to experience it here and now. He says, and I want you to be in community with other folks. I want you to live with others. I want you to live separated from sin, but in the midst of other people. What I've noticed is the enemy of God wants us to be isolated from one another. That's where he attacks us. It's in the darkness, in the secrecy of our hearts where things begin to grow, things fester. But in the light of God, what needs to die, dies, and then what needs to grow in a healthy way begins to grow. So for us to grow in our holiness, we need one another. And I'm not just talking Sunday mornings. It's one small piece. There's other things we begin to do and to grow, and it'll take some time, but that's the journey we're invited into. And understanding that we're saved into a spiritual family, the church. The church is described as the body of Christ, which symbolizes God's capacity to create a spiritual body as well. So think about it this way. In the same way that God breathed life into that dust and Adam came to be, when Jesus breathed into his disciples, out of that the church was birthed. The church is the body of Christ, exists as an extension of God's continued work here on earth. And each one of us is uniquely gifted to carry out our part in ministry here and now. God is our creator. And I believe that he's still doing something new in our midst. I don't know how many of you actually take time to think about God as creator in your life. We walk out and we take it for granted. The air we breathe, the sun that nourishes us, the food we eat, where it comes from, how it grows. Some of you are more in touch with nature. You're always outside. You're looking at, at the sunsets. You're taking it in. But the, the God who created all of that created you. wants to be in relationship with you, has a plan for you, has a plan for us. And I wonder this morning, if we were to engage God our creator, maybe asking him one of four things. I talked about God being cultivator. See, the fact that he's a cultivator comes from the very beginning. We have God as a gardener. As a, he's down on, on the ground playing with dirt. And then out of that, he breathes. And life is formed. You've God getting his hands dirty from the very beginning. I don't think he's afraid to get his hands dirty and, with our dirt right now. 
So when we ask God to cultivate something, I think God's coming around and he's saying, you know what? And those of you who like to work in the garden, I've seen it because I've tried it a couple times. When you want something to be healthy, you start pulling the weeds out. There's stuff that you gotta take away. So when you're asking God to cultivate what only he can cultivate, God starts to pick some stuff out. He says, I wanna remove this from your life. I need to remove this. This has longer roots. But then God begins to grow. He'll plant the seeds in the soils of your soul that need to grow. He'll water it. He'll tell you how to move forward, who to be around. But maybe you're asking God, God, would you cultivate some holiness in me? Would you cultivate some love? That's the work of the Spirit. I may need some patience, God. I may need to be kinder to people. I may not need to be so selfish and arrogant. But Lord, would you cultivate a sense of otherness in me rather than being so self-absorbed? You know what those areas are in your life. Don't be afraid to tell God. God, would you cultivate this in me? Some of us are riddled right now with anxiety. God, would you cultivate a spirit of peace in me? So he begins to pull the things out that are not of him and begins to instill within us peace. And, or bitterness, begins to remove that and puts joy in your heart. Forgiveness, replacing that unforgiveness that was there. But God, would you cultivate it? Because you and I can't do it. Another way we may approach him this morning is as a builder. God, I, my foundation's falling apart. Would you help me build something that's not just for me and my family? Would you help me build something that will outlast me? Something that will reflect your glory in the years to come? Would you help me build a framework through which I can view life? Because I, I've thought about certain things a certain way for so long, but Lord, I need a different frame of reference. God will help you build it. I don't know what it looks like for you. But he likes to build stuff. Some of us have things that have been distorted within our souls, deeply distorted. And the potter wants to put us back on the wheel and begin to shape us, begin to form us more and more into his image. Because I had a certain way of thinking about myself and thinking about others. I've heard words for so many years that have been repeated and the potter gently grabs us and says, I will take you and I will form you. Will you let me? Maybe to, this morning is a good time to come to God, God, our creator, and say, would you form something new in me? Because it's been distorted. And then lastly, maybe we could go to him as, a, as our healer. Whether it's physical healing. Anybody need physical healing? Yeah. Anybody need mental healing? Emotional healing, I'm telling you, all of us at some level, we experience this stuff as a result of sin. The brokenness in us and around us is palpable, and yet our creator is still present. And he says, I'm here, and I want to create something in you. Let us pray. God, we, we come to you as, as your creation. Lord, in many ways, we're broken. And we're asking, Lord, that you would create something new in us. Some of us need a new heart. Create within us a new heart, Lord. Lord heart that is healthy, that can feel, that can experience. We've been cold and shut off. Would you cultivate something in us, Lord, that only you can? I pray in all of us, would you cultivate cultivate a measure of holiness that we would press into you in some manner? Some of us need you to build something, Lord. We try to build our own kingdom, and Lord, would you build yours within us? Use us. 
Lord, some of us have been just deformed. And we need you to form us again. Reshape us. So those lies that we've believed, may your truth come in and set us free. In Jesus' name. And for those of us longing for healing from our infirmities, Lord, I pray for your healing power to come to us. Some of us have been dealing with stuff chronically for a really long time. Diseases that we've battled and just managed. But Lord, we want healing. We want your healing in our bodies so that we can be healthy to share about your goodness, to experience all that you have for us. If that involves a changing of patterns in our lives, Lord, may you cultivate the strength in us to do so. But if if we're crying out for your supernatural healing this morning, Lord, we open our hearts up to you, our our bodies up to you. And ask, Lord, that you would give healing in a way that only you can over us. In Jesus' name. Lord, though you're apart from your creation, you're very involved. And above all, we want more of your holiness. Make us more into you to your image, Lord, whatever it takes. In your name we pray, amen. My child will stand, let's sing this out together.
I guess so. And I want to encourage you this week to press into this facet of God as creator. Listen to, listen to yourself when you pray, even in your head, if you don't pray out loud. I, have, I gravitate to a handful of these, to God as shepherd, redeemer, and father are the ones I tend to go to. There's aspects of creator that I lean on, like healer, but I don't really approach God and think of him as creator intentionally all the time. And I want you to think about it. So as you head to, to lunch, even as you pray, I encourage you to think about how will you address him as creator. Scripture's full of scriptures, but don't just lean on the ones that you're used to because I think God wants to open up our minds and our hearts to a different dimension of him that I know will bless your life. So try it. So go in his name, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.